Okay, hello and welcome. Hello and welcome to tonight's Macula and Me webinar. Uh, my name is Cathy Elf and I'm the Chief Executive of the Macula Society. Um, and we've been uh, presenting these webinars now for more than two years, really, a response initially, of course, to COVID, but subsequently a hit. So we're keeping them going uh, really now in perpetuity. So um, thank you indeed for joining us again this evening. So as ever, we have a, a first class speaker for you tonight, another illustrious clinician researcher, uh, a leader in his field with a global rep reputation. As ever, there will be time for your questions at the end of his talk. So please use the chat function if you want to ask any questions and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. Tonight, we're talking about macular hole and uh, a couple of similar related conditions. Now, these are conditions which are individually a bit less common than age-related macular degeneration, um, but some of them can have quite serious consequences if they're not treated. Now, unlike age-related macular degeneration, uh, macular hole and similar conditions are treated with surgery rather than drug therapy. And so I am delighted to welcome one of the leading experts in this sort of surgery, Professor Tim Jackson. Uh, Tim is Professor of Retinal Research at King's College London, and he's also a consultant vitreoretinal surgeon at uh, King's College Hospital. Um, he leads the uh, King's Ophthalmology Research Unit, and he has a particular interest in trials of clinical devices as opposed to drugs for AMD. He is the editor of the Moorfields Manual of Ophthalmology, and he leads for uh, opth ophthalmology teaching at King's uh, College London Medical School. He also is an advisor to the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence uh, in their Interventional Procedures uh, Advisory uh, Committee area. So, uh, Tim, it's a great pleasure to welcome you. Thank you very much indeed for giving up your time this evening. We are so looking forward to this and I'm going to hand over straight to you now to hear more about macular hole and similar conditions. Tim, thank you very much. Good, Cathy. Well, look, thank you very much for the invite and, and I think the um, the format here is is fantastic. Um, you can hear me, I'm assuming. We can hear you. Thank Lovely. you. Okay, I'm going to just um, bring up the, the talk itself. So you, you can you can see my slides, hopefully. We can. Yeah, perfect. Fantastic. All right. So I want to just uh, talk through um, basically macular hole, but there's a couple of related disorders, um, epiretinal membrane and vitreomacular macular traction. And as I say, they sort of hang together as a, as a presentation. Um, so I wanted to sort of give you a bit of an overview, first of all. So we'll, I, I'll just sort of, we don't need to introduce myself because kathy has been very um, kind with that. Um, we're going to really cover the surgery, surgical side of things, but it's more about the sort of the background of the condition and the prognosis and outcomes and things like that. To put things into context, I'll give you a very, very quick um, overview of the sort of a normal anatomy and then show how it's changed and what goes wrong with these three conditions. And the conditions we're going to talk about a macular hole, epiretinal membrane, which I might, um, by habit, I abbreviate to ERM on, on occasions, and vitreomacular traction, another, another mouthful, I'm afraid. Um, sometimes just abbreviated to VMT. And for each of those three conditions, I'll go through the symptoms, so how, how they might present. Uh, think about what options there are for treatment. Um, I'll focus obviously on surgery because that's kind of the topic for this evening. And we'll have to think about the outcomes. At the end of it all, I'll just have a, a quick slide looking at uh, new developments in terms of what might be, what's happened recently, uh, what's happening now and, and what's on the horizon. So apologies for the use of slides. I do realize that it, it, it might come across as being insensitive using slides in a, a setting where people's vision may, may be inadequate. Um, if you can't see the slides well, you are missing nothing. Uh, they are more prompts for me uh, to remind me what to say and so that I, I don't forget too much. Um, so please don't be um, concerned if you're not seeing the slides, you're, you're, you're not missing the party. Having said that, <laughs> this is probably the most Difficult, difficult, the slide to, to, to not see. It's a, it's a, a picture of the, of the eye, just to remind us where the macula is. So the eye, we often use the analogy of a camera and a, the, the light comes in through the front of the eye and there's a lens inside the eye that focuses the light onto a point uh, in, the, in the middle of the macula. And the retina is a bit like the film in the back of a camera. It absorbs the light to form a, a picture of the outside world. And the light, if you imagine if you get a... Um, like a magnifying glass and hold it under the, uh, under the sun. You can bring the, 
a light to a focus. And you can, if you maybe from childhood remember burning bits of paper and things like that using, using the light. The eye does much the same thing. It brings the light to a focus in the macula in the very back of the eye. And because that light is focused on one point, this very small part of the eye um, has a huge importance because actually most of the information we, we get from the outside world in terms of fine vision is, is this very tiny bit of the macula. And in fact, within the macula, there's an even, even finer bit, the, the very, very center of the macula called the fovea. So you'll hear me talking about the macula, um, and I might mention the fovea as well, but this is a very small piece of real estate in the back of the eye, but a, a very important one. So if we look at the, the, the normal macula, the macula, if we imagine it in side profile, comes along and then there's a, a small dip in the center, which is thinned out to allow the light to get through unimpeded. Um, and normally speaking, that has a, a fairly characteristic um, shape, but in certain conditions, and the ones we're going to cover tonight, the epiretinal membrane, vitreo macular traction, a macular hole, that anatomy is distorted. So if we look particularly at um, the top slide, what I'm going to describe here is a, a condition called epiretinal membrane, where on the surface of the macula, you have a thin film. It's like a piece of cling film that just sits on the, on the surface of the macula. Uh, that in itself isn't a problem, but what tends to happen is that the the membrane contracts and squeezes down, contracts on itself with time, and that pulls on the macula and causes the macula to become thickened. That normal depression, that dip in the fovea that is part of normal anatomy can be lost, and indeed you can end up being from a slight concave, a slight sort of cup shape, to actually being uh, sort of swollen and uh, you know, protuberant of the macula, so it, it creates a significant distortion. Next up is vitreo macular traction, and what you have here is a, a pulling on the, on, the, on the macular structure. So again, it, it pulls up, but it causes a much more focal distortion. And the macular hole um, is an extension of that, and I'll go through these in a, in a little bit more detail. In terms of the, the symptoms, they share fairly similar symptoms across the three conditions. They cause blurred vision, but interestingly enough, if we check people's vision on an eye chart, that doesn't necessarily tell the full story. They might be able to see a a fair way down the eye chart down to see relatively small letters but in fact the vision is is, is worse than that subjectively um, and it's often distortion and the people might might notice they might notice is that the objects uh, appear a different size if they compare their left to their right eye but equally um, sometimes the the condition completely completely asymptomatic um, particularly if it's in your non-dominant eye so most people are right-handed and most people who are right-handed are right eye dominant and if you imagine picking up a telescope and you would just ask yourself, do, you, you know, do I naturally put it up to my right eye or to my left eye? And the one you normally naturally put it to um, without, you know, outside of eye disease is your so-called dominant eye normally. Um, but if you have a condition that affects the macula and the non-dominant eye uh, in particular, you may not be aware of it. You just, your brain just switches over to using the other eye. Um, and actually you can, you can get by with, with vision in one eye. And actually, sadly, a lot of people have sometimes quite severe macular problems that they're not aware of until for some reason maybe they cover one eye and they notice that the other is not working. Or often if they just visit a, a routine visit to the opticians who picks up on these changes. Now, a lot of opticians now um, getting a piece of equipment called optical coherence tomography or OCT for short, and it's a fan fantastic bit of kit. Uh, it shows the macula in extremely high resolution um, and you can pick up on changes that might have gone unnoticed in previous years. So as more and more of these OCTs uh, move into optometric practice, I think we can expect to see more and more people presenting with macular issues that might have been missed. And hopefully we'll be catching this disease earlier so that we can, we can do more um, to treat it. So we're going to, as I say, go each of the, through each of those three conditions in turn. And I want to start with epiretinal membrane, or as I said before, ERM. The cells that grow on the surface of the eye um, contract, as I mentioned, but they tend to do this quite slowly. Um, so sometimes the, the epiretinal membrane can sit there for many, many years uh, without causing any symptoms at all. Um, but conversely, in some patients, what will happen is that, that contraction and distortion of the macula causes distortion, uh, changes in the clarity of vision. But the severity is really quite wide. You'll have some patients who have really very, very little in terms of symptoms or none at all through to people whose vision can be really severely affected. So if you're diagnosed with an epiretinal membrane, um, a key question is whether or not this is going to, you know, if it's tolerable at that stage, the key question is whether or not it's going to progress. Um, maybe it will stay the same, and often they do. Um, but what you can be reasonably sure of in most settings is that it won't get better. Uh, and very, very seldom is the case that epiretinal membrane goes away. Once it's there, it's usually going to stay the same or get worse. In terms of management options, it kind of follows from that. If you've got a mild 
stable epiretinal membrane, then the, the, the advice may be to observe that. Conversely, if the membrane is progressive um, and the symptoms are significant, uh, then it might be that surgery is the, is the best route forward. Um, but it's always a balance of risk and benefit. No operation is, is zero risk. So it's important that people think about whether or not this is a condition that they want to, um, they want to intervene with. Uh, and it's very important that you understand the risks of any intervention so you can balance that against the sort of magnitude of the symptoms. In terms of ERM surgery, um, and in fact, the other three conditions as well. So what I'm going to say here is common to the treatment of the other three conditions too. The treatment is a, is a surgery called pars plane of vitrectomy or PPV or just often just called vitrectomy. Um, so I wanted to just talk you, tell you a little bit about that. Um, the surgery can be done most commonly under a local anaesthetic, but if patients are anxious, a bit of sedation might make the journey a little bit easier. Um, for some patients, they just can't countenance the idea of um, being awake during the operation, which generally is not as bad as you might imagine. Uh, and then in that setting, um, patients can certainly elect to have a general anaesthetic if the health is up to them. It's most commonly done as a day case, meaning that you come in and go home on the same day. Um, the surgery involves three very small openings uh, through the white of the eye. So just, just below, behind the cornea, the clear window in the front of the eye, just behind that, about two or three millimeters back, uh, we make three very, very small openings, you know, about the size of the tip of a, of a pen uh, into the back of the eye. Um, there are three, the three openings are to do three things. Um, one is to maintain fluid uh, infusion in the eye, so that, that pushes water into the eye to maintain the pressure of the eye. The eye is a bit like a car tire. If you make a hole, the, the fluid will leak out and the, and the eye will collapse. So one, one tube uh, keeps the eye inflated. Now the second um, opening is to pass a very small fiber optic cable into the eye that carries light into the eye so the surgeon can see what they're doing. And then the third instrument is so that the surgeon can do whatever manipulation it might be. And in this case, uh, removing the epiretinal membrane from the surface of the macula. If we're going to be moving inside the eye, we need to clear the vitreous gel. So the inside of the eye is filled with a clear watery gel. And if you move around, you can snag the gel. The gel is attached to the retina. That can cause a tear in the retina and cause a retinal detachment, which is a you know, potentially serious problem. So in that setting, what we do is we take up the vitreous gel. Because the, the epiretinal membrane is optically clear, and we're operating on something that can be a, you know, down to a, a thousandth of a millimeter, a tiny, tiny, tiny um, dimension. Uh, and it's optically clear, so the combination of those two mean it can be very hard to see. So in that setting, what we'll often do is pour a blue dye into the back of the eye that stains the epiretinal membrane so that we can see to remove it. Once we've peeled the epiretinal membrane, we check the retina, just make sure there aren't any breaks or tears because they, you know, they do occur. Uh, if that's the case, we may treat it with a uh, freezing probe or a laser to, to seal the break. And then we might put a bubble of gas inside the eye to, to ensure that that break has time to heal and then the gas will just um, leave the eye spontaneously over time. If patients have a, a cataract, we might treat the cataract at the same time. Um, in that setting, um, the surgery is, takes a little bit longer, um, but it, it ends up you know, removing the cataract relatively effectively. Some patients, even if they haven't got a cataract, uh, will elect to have the cataract, the lens taken out anyway, because we know for sure that vitrectomy will cause um, uh, you know, cataract within a few months or years. So rather than know that they're going to come back for a second cataract surgery later on, they say, well, let's get the cataract done at the same time to, to, you know, for convenience sake. If you've already had a cataract operation, then you won't, you won't need to have um, cataract surgery done again. After surgery, the eyes are usually covered with a, a soft pad and then a hard shield. Um, they stay on overnight and then the next morning um, they come off. But oftentimes we'll advise patients to wear the hard shield just at night for a week uh, to keep the eye protected you know, in case you bang your eye in your sleep. Typically, we'll give patients about a month's um, treatment with eye drops just to prevent any infection getting inside the eye and to reduce inflammation. And then they'll normally return for about four or five visits uh, over the course of the next three to six months just to keep a watch on things. And then typically, if they'll send them off, we'll send you off to your optician maybe in about sort of four to six weeks after surgery just to get spectacles adjusted, particularly if you've had cataract surgery. One thing I would say about epiretinal membrane surgery is that recovery is quite slow. So you need to be reasonably patient. There'll be a fair gain usually within the first two or three months, um, but it can take a long time. And there's some studies to show that the, the OCT I showed you earlier can prove as much as a year or two afterwards. So you do need to be quite patient with this. And the other caution is, although the vision is better in most patients, it's not better in all patients. A tiny minority would lose vision due to complications. 
Um, but it's seldom fully normal, even if the operation goes swimmingly. Usually speaking, the, the eye will not see as clearly as someone who hasn't had an epiretinal membrane. And if, you know, if the patients have a normal other eye and they compare between the two eyes, they may well notice that the vision is, is not perfect. So you need to have sort of realistic expectations, but we wouldn't offer the surgery if we didn't think the, the benefits outweighed the risks. So that's epiretinal membrane. Uh, the next I want to talk to is uh, vitreomacular traction or VNT. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is a condition where the vitreous um, would normally pull away from the retina. That's a normal aging process, nothing to worry about. Uh, but unfortunately, if it, it hangs on with an abnormal adhesion to the macula, it can pull on the macula, up, pull it up and cause a distortion, more focal than with an epiretinal membrane. It can be very mild. It can be completely asymptomatic, um, right through to really very troubling vision. And it can progress. Um, it can also remain the same. Um, but unlike epiretinal membrane, which tends not to resolve, VMT does sometimes get better. So sometimes it pulls on the macula, causes a distortion, and then it pulls free. Um, the bit VMT is released and the macula can go back to, to a normal position. In terms of the options for VMT, uh, again, like with epiretinal membrane, you could observe it if it was mild, um, or you may choose to do that even if it's not mild, just to see if it's going to get better on its own. So you would do a series of OCT scans to see whether or not it's on the mend. Conversely, it can get worse, uh, in which case that might be that the decision to operate comes sooner. There's a third drug uh, called ochroplasmin, um, which involves trying to dissolve the gel of the eye. Um, and I'll go through that in a bit more detail in surgery, which I'll also cover in a bit more detail as well, but only if the symptoms justify it. So ochroplasmin, that's um, sold under the brand name Jatreya. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the opinion within the consultant body is fairly divided about the pros and cons of ochroplasmin. Uh, some surgeons think it's rubbish um, and, and don't even offer it to patients. Others um, are, are more happy to, to put this into the, into the decision list. Um, so you'd be aware of that. Um, it's given just as a single injection into the eye. That sounds like eye injections are not as dreadful as you might imagine. Um, used for a lot of a lot of macular conditions nowadays. It has a, a lowish success rate. So whereas surgery will pretty much always manage to release the VMT, ochroplasmin only works in about you know a quarter to maybe just under a half of patients. If it works, it's fantastic because it avoids surgery. Um, but of course, you may then need to progress to surgery. And if it doesn't work, you can still move forward to have an operation. There are various side effects. Um, most are temporary, but they can be quite intrusive. Often patients notice a lot of floaters afterwards. Sometimes you can get transient blurred vision as well. It is uh, expensive, uh, very expensive. In fact, it costs more than a vitrectomy surgery due to the drug cost. Um, but in fairness, it's, it, is, it is available in the NHS, so cost shouldn't be an issue for patients. In terms of VMT surgery, again, um, pass plane of vitrectomy, so very similar to the process I discussed for ERM surgery. Uh, we remove the vitreous and that in itself usually releases the vitreomacular traction. Um, and like ERM surgery, it can be combined with cataract surgery as well if the patient wishes. Again, similar kind of post-op routine, you'd have the eye covered with a pad and a shield overnight, come off the next day, drops for about a month. And then patients would return for anything between sort of three, four, five visits over, you know, anything from about three to six months, assuming that everything is going well. As before, we'd normally send the patients off to the optician about four to six weeks after surgery. The recovery is a fair bit faster than epiretinal women. And it takes longer than something you know, more straightforward like cataract surgery, but in general, the recovery is more complete and, and quicker with VMT than it is with epiretinal membrane. And most patients do get a benefit. So moving next to the, the, to the last of the three conditions is uh, macular hole. The cause is, is very similar to vitreomacular traction, but I would, I would consider this generally to, to be a more severe condition. So whereas the vitreous was pulling and distorting the macula before, in this condition it actually pulls off what we call avulses, um, some macular tissue. So you end up with a, a full thickness hole uh, in the center of the macula. So that absent tissue is, you know, is not seeing. And patients have usually you know, quite significant loss of vision. Um, only a minority of cases do resolve, but they can do. Nothing like as common as, as the resolution that you get with VMT. Um, but with early cases, they can sometimes get better. But most cases, once they're established, tend to persist or worsen. But it's not a condition where you would go completely blind. You would, you would lose your central vision. Um, so it is you know, significant because uh, that central vision is by far the most important, but you don't lose all your vision, your peripheral vision, as with most sort of isolated macular conditions would, would generally remain intact. 
In terms of the management options, as I say, observation is, is, is not usually advised. Um, Ocroplasmin, the, the same drug we mentioned for vitro macular traction, can be used. Again, that, that controversy exists for the use of uh, ocroplasmin for macular hole as well. Um, and you have to use it in particular cases. You can't, only a certain subset of patients would be suitable, as, as is true of VMT, VMT in fairness. Um, but for those select cases, it, it is an option that somebody to consider. Um, and surgery is usually what most patients end up having. And we usually try and get that done reasonably quickly. In terms of the ocroplasmin, um, injections exactly the same as it, as it was for um, BMT. The success rate in terms of closing macular hole is about 30% of select cases. And in these patients, they avoid surgery, which is, you know, which is a good thing, but it does delay surgery. Similar side effects to, to vitro macular traction. Um, another one that's peculiar to this particular use of ocroplasmin is sometimes the macular hole gets bigger, um, but it still seems to be you know, amenable to surgery in most, in most cases. So moving to what I would call the kind of the standard approach for macular hole is uh, pass plane of vitrectomy, so same operation as the previous two. Um, slight variation in terms of how we handle this, rather than there's no membrane to peel in terms of an epiretinal membrane, but there is part of the inner anatomy of, of the, the retina is a layer, the innermost layer calls the epiretinal membrane, again, a very, very, very thin membrane. Um, and that's, that's meant to be there. Uh, but what we find is that the sort of elasticity of the internal limiting membrane seems to keep the hole open. And we tend to um, open up, you know, peel off this that inner layer, which doesn't seem to cause harm to the retina. Uh, but by reducing that inner elasticity, it seems to allow the hole to sort of fall back and, and close down. And then critically, what we do is in inject a bubble of gas inside the eye. Now, you might use gas for the other two conditions if there is a problem like a, a complication, a, you know, retinal tear or such like, but you don't use the gas routinely in the previous two conditions. Whereas a macular hole, we always put in a, a bubble of gas. Um, and the idea is that it, it helps the hole to close up. We don't know exactly how it works, but it, but it seems to. Um, as before, we'd cover the eye with a pad and shield overnight, and then the patients would come back the next day. Now, one of the key things to take on board with macular hole surgery is that the gas takes, depending on which gas we use, typically about a month or two to go away. And while the gas is in the eye, there's a significant you know, blurring of vision. I mean, worse than it was before the macular hole. You can't go up to high altitude because the gas expands at altitude and can put the pressure inside the eye out, you know, perilously high, in fact, and you can lose the vision, so you really mustn't fly. Also, if you have a general anaesthetic, it's worth telling the anaesthetist that you've got a bubble of gas inside your eye. Some anaesthetic gases can do the same thing. The significant controversy about the use of uh, position, head positioning. Um, now, if you, what we would do as a kind of a default, if you like, historically, would be to put the bubble of gas in the eye and then ask patients to go face down. And the thought is that by you know, pushing the gas bubble, which floats inside the eye, and that way it floats the bubble onto the macula so that the, the gas encourages the hole to close. There are some um, studies suggesting that for small holes, um, that head positioning might not be essential, um, but it's not, it's hard to prove that it's not helpful. Um, and generally speaking, you know, probably a majority of patients do end up in head down positioning for anything from five to you know, seven days afterwards. And that's a significant burden. Um, we would normally say, you know, put your head face down for 45 to 50 minutes out of every hour. Uh, and you know during during waking days so really you've only got 10 minutes off every hour to move around be active and it's, it's good to be active to avoid getting clots dvts in your legs um, but it's not easy going so you know, once you have the surgery you will be out of commission for uh, five to seven days if you're posturing afterwards again eye drops for about a month um, maybe about four to five visits over three to six months similar to the other two operations um, again, off to the optician about four weeks after surgery when the gas is gone, um, or at least four weeks because you need the gas gone really before they can do their bed. The holes are closed in about 80 to 90 percent of, of cases. You know, the, the lower rates um, would be larger holes and more long standing holes and the success, higher success rate in those with short, um, short duration small holes. If the hole doesn't close with an operation, we can repeat the surgery, but the success rate does go down with each consecutive operation. Again, the visit, vision is better in the, in the majority of holes that close, but it's seldom full, fully normal. So even if the hole closes up, patients will probably still notice some residual symptoms, but hopefully be a lot, a lot better than it was preoperatively. So that's the three conditions. Um, I was sort of brief to just have a think about new developments in macular hole, ERM and VMT surgery. Um, it's not as dynamic as you know, some of the other conditions like um, age-related macular degeneration or AMD, where there's you know, huge developments going on, masses of uh, new technologies and treatments arriving almost every day. 
Um, but there are, you know, there have been innovations in the last few years. I think the use of the dyes that we, the blue dye I mentioned, to help find the macular tissue has made a, a big improvement in terms of the safety and effectiveness. Ocroplasma was a, was a definite innovation, as I say. It's, it's not met favour with, with all surgeons and actually its use is, is in relatively small numbers of patients. Um, surgery, the openings that we make have got smaller and smaller and that makes for a speedier recovery and, and probably also you know, more safe surgery because you're not causing so many breaks and tears in the retina. So those I would say would be the biggest innovations in the last you know, few years. In terms of things that people are really spending a lot of attention on now, um, really we want to sort of boost that macular hole closure rate because it's very frustrating when you do the surgery operation goes perfectly well but the hole just doesn't close so we're looking at other ways of doing that and a number of people are trying different things that 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 flap of internal limiting membrane rather than just throwing it away people are trying to sort of use that to to close the hole up um using that to if you like sort of fill it and create a barrier over the hole people are in injecting um blood uh, blood products to see if that helps close up the hole as well I think the other big advance is the OCT imaging, those um, pictures that can be very, very high resolution of the macula have got better and better and better. So we can now see the macula in you know, really fine detail. And that may give us a better indication as to which patients are going to respond, particularly for every retinal membrane where the, ba the, the benefits can sometimes be a bit marginal. So trying to decide who's going to do well with surgery versus you know, with the attendant risks of surgery can be difficult, but I think our better quality OCT imaging and better understanding of that is, is improving with time. In terms of the future, uh, what I would really like to see is getting rid of gas for macular hole. As I say, gas, gas is literally a pain in the neck if you've got your head positioned down for several days afterwards. And there's a number of innovations trying to see if we can close the hole in other ways. Uh, probably still involves surgery, but if we can do some things to try and you know, close the hole such that patients don't need to head position or have gas, that would be a, a very exciting step forward. But we're certainly not, um, certainly not there yet. So I think the take home messages for all three conditions, um, if you're unlucky enough to have one of these things happen, I wouldn't panic it, you know, they, they are treatable. Um, I hadn't covered the risks of surgery in great detail because there really isn't scope to do that. Um, but I think if you're diagnosed with this, um, have a really good chat with your vitreo retinal surgeon um, and just really ask whether or not, um, is this something that needs treatment? Um, and what are the details? What are the details of, of, of the risks to so that you can make that balance in your own mind as to whether or not you know, surgery is justified. If you have symptoms, act early. I mean, it's sort of stating the obvious, but a very simple thing to do is to just check each eye separately. It doesn't take a moment to do. There are specialist things like an Amsler chart, which you can find easily enough online and down, download, but just simply covering one eye up once a week just to check that the vision's okay and the other eye is a very, very simple thing to do um, so that if there is a problem, you present nice and early. As I say, some of the opticians have now got uh, optical coherence tomography or OCT. Um, it does usually bring an extra charge, but I would generally say if you can afford it, that's money well spent because the OCTs are so good at picking up on changes. I think it, it really is, is worthwhile. So if the optician has that or you want to seek out an optician that does, then ask if they've got OCT and, and have it because it's a great way to keep a watch on the macula. Um, and the other thing I would just say is all three conditions are treatable, but don't expect the vision to be, to be perfect. For further information, the Macular Society are a you know, fantastic, fantastic organization. They have a lot of support available to patients and you obviously know them already if you're, if you're here for this um, broadcast, but I would generally you know, have a look at their website as a good port of call and they've got a telephone number you can call as well. Uh, the, the Vitreo Retinal Society in the UK um, is also got some patient information leaflet. Um, that provides a sort of, I think, a very general overview for each of those conditions in terms of the details of the risks. And it's worth downloading that and having a look at it. But I would encourage you, as I say, if you have these conditions, to chat to your own vitro retinal surgeon, because they do need to be fleshed out in more detail. And everybody's risks are you know, slightly different. So I think that's me done in terms of the kind of presentation side of things. But I know that um, you know, the, the team are very keen that we spend as much time as necessary to, to, to sort through questions. So I'm more than happy to take any questions that, that there might be, both on, on what we presented and any, any other sort of you know, other questions about BMT, ERM and macular holes. I'm, I'm ha happy to field the questions as best I can. Then thank you very much indeed. That was absolutely great and a very fascinating talk. Thank you very much indeed. So we have got some questions coming, uh, coming in, as you might expect. Can I just um, ask you something um, about, about, you talked about OCT and... Um, uh, and of course, this does mean many opticians have these machines now um, and it doesn't cost a lot, 10, 20 pounds, perhaps 30 at the most, I think, probably to get to see. But it does mean, as you sort of indicated, that people may be being 
diagnosed with these conditions a bit earlier than they would have been in the past, possibly before they get symptoms, they, before they notice themselves. So do, do can people be treated at that stage? I mean, for example, I'll declare a complete interest here. I was diagnosed with an epiretinal membrane a couple of years ago. I have absolutely no, no symptoms. If the vision doesn't return always to normal, which was one of your big take home messages at the end of your talk, should people be trying to get treatment before they have symptoms or is it not going to be treatable before? People aren't gonna get treated before they have symptoms. Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Um, what I would say is that the, um, if you're a new member, you know, you, you, it's very kind of you to have such a good example because, <laughs> um, because the ERM is, is, is actually, if you look at, populations, you will often find that, that there's a lot of undiagnosed epiretinal membrane out there and the vast majority of patients won't need intervention. And as you say, you know, the downside of having these exquisitely sensitive devices is they can pick up on things that really don't matter. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so there, there is a two edges to the sword. But what I would say is that I would still think it's better to know that you've got it to, so that the patient knows to monitor for symptoms. They'll, they'll, you know, it will increase vigilance in terms of you know, then paying attention to the to the vision in that eye. And it's very easy to repeat the OCT scans and give an objective measure as to whether or not it's changing over time. So you're right, it, it may lead to overdiagnosis. It may lead to people being worried about things that don't really represent a threat to vision, but I still think it's, it's safer to know what's there, even if you then are reassured that nothing needs to be done about it. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a good question, but epiretinal membrane oftentimes doesn't need intervention. And you're, you're a case in point, obviously. Does it run in families? Because my mother also had epiretinal membrane. Is it is it is it a genetic thing? No, not like um, not like sort of macular degeneration and things like that, where they, you know, there was definitely a genetic predisposition. Predisposition. There are other predispositions. So patients who've had inflammation inside the eye, patients who've had retinal tears, you know, retinal detachments, diabetes with late, particularly with you know previous laser treatment and things like that. Inflammation inside the eye can do it as well. So there was a, a, most patients have so I've got idiopathic epiretinal membrane with no obvious cause, or there isn't a, a specific family history, um, but it can be associated with some more specific diseases. And it affects older people, I imagine, more than younger people. It does, yeah. So it tends to be, you know, sort of generally, um, you know, middle to late, middle age um, retirees and things. But it, there is a fair spread of things, particularly if you've got some of those predisposing conditions that can occur earlier. But generally, it occurs in you know, middle age and beyond. And is that true of vitreo uh, macular traction and macular hole as a block? Is that, are they all more likely in older people? They are. Yeah, they are. As I say, in the absence of any obvious precipitating factor, they tend to be sort of, you know, but, but, but not super, not as, as, as old as, say, age-related macular degeneration. I was also very interested in your description of the surgery and these tiny holes that you make and, and so on. Do you, do you use magnifying? Is it done under a microscope? Or you don't do it just with normal vision, do you? I mean, it, it's okay. very, yep. very detailed type of surgery, almost microsurgery. Not microsurgery, but almost, isn't it? No, no it is microsurgery. I mean, it's the most, probably the most micro of all surgeries. So we're, we're, um, we, we're using an operating microscope for all of this. Um, you, to, to put things into to, to context, the internal limiting membrane is about one or two microns thick, so much, much thinner than a human hair. Um, so we're operating on things that are really very, very, very fine indeed, and you, you wouldn't, you just absolutely couldn't do it without a microscope. I was worried about the, the tremble on the, on the hand. Yeah, yes, I mean, um, interestingly, even things like the pa patient's breathing, you know, but we, what we tend to do is rest our hands on the patient's forehead, so that we we move with the patient, um, and you know, yes, you know, I think you know when people are learning, there often is an, an element of tremor, that, that, but that you know that settles with time. Robotic surgery is beginning to be looked at, isn't it, for for some of these very fine pieces of work? Well. It, it is, but interestingly, um, it, it, it's very attractive as a concept. Um, but one of the issues is that you know, once you can do this, once you've been trained then actually we, we can do it very effectively. You know, it, it, it's, it would seldom be the case that a vitro, you know, consultant vitro-retinal surgeon would, would not be able to find or remove an epiretinal membrane. Mm. So one of the questions is, are, are we creating more tech? Are we solving a problem with robotics? I mean, it's very sexy stuff. I mean, it's, you know, it really is. Um, but actually there isn't necessarily a problem. I mean, we, we are able to, to deal with these conditions effectively. So I'm not, with robotics, you've got a whole, bunch of issues with stabilizing the robotic system with on the patient um 
So as I say, you don't want the patient, if you've got your hands resting on the patient, that's one thing. If the robotic system is mounted to another apparatus and the patient moves, then actually you may end up with bigger movement from the patient, for example, than you would from the surgeon rested on, on their forehead. So yeah. it's, it's not straightforward, but it's, um, as I say, it, it, it's sexy stuff. Very interesting. Okay, so let's get to some of our questions now, because um, uh, a question here from somebody who had a macular hole, had surgery, the operation was technically successful, although the vision wasn't as perfect um, uh, as um, the retinal cells have not probably lined up correctly. A year or two, two later, he has developed dry AMD. Is this common? Is it any connection between dry AMD or a AMD and macular hole? Is there any um, reason why this person should have got both? No, it, um, it, it, it's a good question. So generally speaking, um, they're, they're separate conditions. So you wouldn't necessarily predict that somebody with a macular hole is, is more likely to get, um, you know, dry AMD or wet AMD. I mean, the issue is though that dry AMD is extremely common. Um, and, you know, you wouldn't be surprised that a proportion of patients with macular hole do develop dry AMD. One thing I would say is that sometimes you can end up with a degree of atrophy that can that can simulate it can look like dry AMD so I guess um, particularly in patients who might be very short-sighted in which case they may be more likely to get a macular hole they may be more likely to get macular atrophy so there can sometimes be some confusion in terms of the diagnosis but you know to your question generally speaking um, that you wouldn't you wouldn't predict that the macular hole had caused the dry AMD. Another question you mentioned high myopia so um, a person who um, ha had treatment but wasn't offered ocriplasmin, even though surgery, she suggests, is higher risk for her because of she has high myopia. Is that is that right, that there's a higher risk to the surgery if you have high myopia? Would you would a, a myopic patient, short-sightedness, this is what we're talking about, isn't it? Um, higher levels of short-sightedness, perhaps a better candidates for um, uh, Jitria? Yeah, no, that's a, it's a really, it's a very, um, it's an astute question because it, exactly the, the, you do increase the risks of you know, in particular retinal detachment. So retinal detachment is probably the most, you know, I mean, there are se more severe conditions that can occur as a complication of surgery like infection, but they're very rare. They're, you know, maybe in the region of one in 500 operations. Whereas retinal detachment might be anything, you know, depending on which data you want to read between one and 5%, which is not, it's not a tiny, tiny minority of patients. And almost certainly if you're um, myopic, that risk will be increased. So in other words, the, the biggest problem with the surgery in terms of complications um, is is definitely magnified by having a mac, uh, you know, being highly myopic. The other thing is actually it can be technically more challenging to remove the the, the, the internal limiting membrane because the retina is very very thin in, in macular holes. So so yes, the surgery is technically more difficult. There are greater complications, but we would generally need to, to treat it now. Some of those risks also apply to ocroplasmin. So um, some of the clinical trials of ocroplasmin uh, excluded patients who are high myopes, and you know, quite possibly because of that risk. Um, so, you know, so I, th I think the question is right. I think generally speaking, ocroplasma would be a good thing to consider if you're highly myopic, um, because it would avoid you know, some of those risks of surgery. But those small risks of, of from ocroplasma might some of those might also be slightly magnified as well. And we have left we have less data on the effectiveness of ocroplasma in very short sighted people because some of the you know the trials would have excluded them on the basis of that. So it's a, that's a, it's a long answer, but the short answer is um, yes, it would be definitely something to consider. Okay, so if, if it should ever happen again, then um, raise the question of ocroplasmin, clearly. Um, somebody here who's had a vitrectomy for macular hole uh, and um, uh, now has uh, an epiretinal membrane. Uh, it's not clear whether it's in the same eye. Something seems to flare up every so often in this person. Is that is that a common? No, not so much, actually. So, so sometimes you can have uh, both a macular hole and an epiretinal membrane. But if you remember, I, I, I suggested that you know what the normal surgery would involve taking out the internal limiting membrane of the retina. That's when you're doing macular. So when you do macular hole surgery, you take out the innermost layer of the retina called the internal limiting membrane. Now, one of the, the bonuses of that is it tends to make a recurrence of an epiretinal membrane less likely. So if anything, you would predict that someone who's had a macular hole surgery and has had their ILM peeled they might be less likely to get an epiretinal membrane than, than the general public, for example. In, unless, of course, it was there beforehand and it was left behind. But if it's new, that would, that would be a little bit unusual. I mean, not unheard of at all. Um, if, of course, it's the other eye that's developed epiretinal membrane, um, then that wouldn't be terribly surprising because, then, you know, you can definitely have, you know, one condition in each eye. 
Mm. And, and another person here who's, um, and this has come up twice, this phrase lamella macular hole. So um, a, a, this person had been diagnosed with macular hole and told he needed surgery. However, he was then told the, from the hospital that it was a lamella, lamella, I don't know how you say it, macular hole, and that doesn't benefit from surgery. So I think we're all confused about this one. Perhaps you could explain the lamella, if that's the right yeah, pronunciation. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad that question was asked, actually, because it, 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 it in fact, in hindsight, that would have been a good thing to put into the talk just to clarify the difference. So a lamella macular hole is, um, it has, you know, the hole is kind of, it starts if you like, but it doesn't go all the way through. So it's what we might call a partial thickness hole. And that often doesn't mean surgery. And it can, it can often coexist with epiretinal membranes. So sometimes the epiretinal membrane can cause a, a lamella macular hole. Um, and quite right, oftentimes we wouldn't operate for a lamella macular hole because the outer layer of the retina, which is the most important, because that's where the cells, the photoreceptors that absorb the light are, is still intact. So you can lose a little bit of the inner layer of the retina, and still that can be compatible with quite normal vision. So generally speaking, we're much less inclined to recommend surgery for lamella macular holes versus the full thickness macular holes that we covered earlier on. Okay, that's really helpful, thank you. Um, now, uh, somebody here has asked about OCT scanners. Um, uh, she has uh, minus 25, so that is, I'm assuming that means very short-sighted indeed. <laughs> um, and at her hospital, some operators and certain scanners give very different scans, some being too fuzzy, and some operators insist she wears a contact lens, an RGP contact lens to be scanned. Is this variability common, this person wants to ask? Yeah, so it can be quite hard to urge people. I mean, 25 is, is, is very, as you say, it's highly myopic. We would normally say a high myopic is someone with you know, more than six diopters of myopia. So this is m multiples of that. Um, and that can make it difficult for the machine to, to sort of find its orientation in the back of the eye and it can degrade the quality of the OCT. So it wouldn't be unsurprising that some of the images are, are better than others. You know, a good experienced um, you know, photographer or OCT technician can usually get pretty good images, but it, it can be a challenge and, and they can be a bit variable. Yeah. Um, so apart from, um, uh, you mentioned also this posturing um, business. This is what is, is this the, the name for the face down, downwards and, and gravity or, or basically the, the, air, the, the gas bubble then floats, doesn't it, and, and presses up against the back of the, uh, back of the eye. I mean, that must be actually quite a demanding um, after post-operative bit of activity that has to happen. Um, I, I think you were quite, um, you were involved, I, I think, in the ochroplasm in trials, weren't you? And presumably your interest in that was because of this patient problem, that, you know, this challenge for patients, that you, um, you really did want to find something that would um, remove the need for that. Is that right? Is that part of your motivation for that trial? Yeah, yeah very much so. I mean, as I say, the, the, the gasp, I mean, there, there are lots of downsides to surgery. You know, there, there are risks, as I say, it causes cataract, put the pressure, eye pressure up. Um, you have these rare, rare events that can really devastate the vision. Um, you know, there's an expense, there's surgical resources and things like that as well. So, there, are, you know, the head positioning is one of the biggest problems of macular hole surgery, but, but, but by no means the only one. And if, if, on the other hand, we could achieve the same thing by just a, you know, a very quick injection in the outpatient department, um, that would be fantastic. As I say, ochroplasmin hasn't really gained the kind of traction you might have anticipated. You know, I think a lot of people are very disappointed by the results. Um, but yes, getting rid of the bubble would be one of the key elements to, to, to ochroplasmin as a, as a good option if it was, if it was maybe more effective. Mm. Another person who's had a um, macular hole operation now has choroidal neovascular membrane associated with macular talon, I can never say this word, talangectasia. Yep. <laughs> What does that mean, basically, this, um, this uh, viewer is asking, what does that mean and is, is, how is that treated and, um, uh, and what's the therapy for that? So generally, that, that, that's a, it's quite a different condition. It's not something we would treat surgically. Um, so MAC tell, as it gets called, called for short, is a, is a change in the, in the blood vessels in the macula in the back of the eye. And that they in themselves can cause issues with sometimes leakage of fluid, but sometimes you get a, a more aggressive process where there are new blood vessels growing or choroidal neovascularization or CNV for short, which is similar to that you have in, in age-related macular degeneration. So they both have this kind of potentially common endpoint 
um, which can be treated, um, but, but but not surgically. That would usually be with injections to try and shut down the um, you know the CMV in the back of the eye. So if it persisted then, and that was going to be a problem, then it would be the same sort of treatment that you get for wet AMD. It's the wet AMD treatment, isn't it? That we, they... Yes, I mean not y yes. If there's secondary CMV, then yeah. yes, it would be anti VEGF therapy, same, same love, type of thing. Blood vessels, that's right. And, and in fact, this the same um, uh, person is says he's in, in, unfortunate to have had macular hole surgery twice, but would like to say to anyone thinking of having it that it is not that bad. <laughs> uh, he didn't have a general. Uh, anaesthetic, but uh, was kept informed about what's happening. So lots of people are are pretty traumatised by the idea of having an operation on their eye while they're away, because of course you imagine that you're going to be able to see all the um, you know the scalpel coming towards you, whatever it is. And people think the same with injections, don't they? Think they're going to see the the needle coming through the pupil or something like that. So yeah. what what is it like? Do you think to have, you've not had it done yourself, but it's not as bad. You, you touched on that. You hinted at that. That's right. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, I've maybe be focused on some of the downsides of surgery, um, you know, and I think we, we tend to maybe be a, a little bit defensive when we're, we're describing interventions. But um, but you're quite right. I mean, most patients, I think, are, are, are nervous about the thought of it. Um, they often enter into the surgery unit going, oh, my goodness, I'm, I'm terrified. And, and interestingly, actually, no small minority actually fall asleep during the operation. They've turned up with all this nervous energy. The drape goes on them. It's nice and warm and quiet. There might be some peaceful music playing in the background. And they suddenly realize, you know what? I can't feel a thing. The anesthetic has worked nicely. I'm just lying here for 40 minutes or so while the operation takes place. And actually, as I say, they'll, they'll sometimes doze off. So I, I, in general, I mean, no two people are the same, but in general, I think the anxiety is, is greater than it needs to be um, you know, versus the experience itself. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put people off having surgery because they were terrified. Um, it, it's usually better than you imagine. And I, I, you may have touched on this and I've forgotten, but how, how common are these conditions? I mean, they're, they're not as common as a AMD. Um, I think um, uh, we think there are perhaps about um, six or 700,000 people in the UK with age-related macular degeneration at the moment. And that is increasing in uh, incidence because uh, of the age uh, of the age profile of the patient, basically, isn't it? That's the um, that's the reason. So um, the we think that age-related macular degeneration will double in the number of people with it will double between something like 2010 and 2050, and that's quite a big big jump of people, isn't it? You know, by 20, 2040, even one and a half million people with age-related macular degeneration. What's that pattern like? Do we know what that pattern is like in these conditions? Yeah, so so um, so because it is a, it's it's a disease of older adulthood, um, it will increase as the population ages. So we so we do expect the numbers to go up, but it's nothing like the numbers of patients with AMD. I mean, it really is. It's it's common for me because I'm a veterinary retinal surgeon, but there are you know um, there are many many more numbers of patients with with AMD than there are with macular hole, for example. Um, so it's a, it's a tiny minority of patients by comparison. Mm. And and um, where, where do you think we're going with this? You talked about, you know, we want to get rid of the gas bubble problem and so on. But um, are there any other drugs on the horizon? Are there? I mean, if it's a smaller number of patients, is that does that stop as much interest in the research? Do you find it difficult to get funds uh, for, for macular hole research? Yeah, it, 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 it is. Um, you, you're not going to attract big farm and things to this. And I, I think particularly... Um, you know, I, I don't. I'm not. A, I'm not into the finance of it, but I. I don't imagine Ocraplasmin has, has has made money for the company. I mean, maybe it has, but it's it's nothing like the sort of the you know, blockbuster drugs you've got for AMD. So sadly, I don't think um, you know the sort of if you like the relative lack of success with Ocraplasmin is not going to drive a lot of other people into the into the field. So I'm not aware of anyone else kind of trying to replicate the Ocraplasmin trials, uh, which is a pity in a way because you know I suspect. You know, I suspect there would be a way to do this other than other than surgery at the minute. Mm. Um, and it's also, in fairness, something like epiretinal membrane. It's a relatively simple mechanical problem. I mean, it's you know, it's a it's a layer of scar tissue on the surface of the retina. Intrinsically, you just want to peel it off. I mean, maybe that's a very simple surgical approach to it all, but it probably doesn't need lots and lots of research. You know, in, in the sense, you know, it's not it doesn't have the complexity of a disease like AMD, for example. Mm. Um Somebody has asked about um, whether it's more common in women than men after after a certain age. Um, I mean, there's 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 some interest, isn't there, in hormonal impacts on even AMD? 
now? Is it more common in women? Do we know older women? So men? macular hole is more common. Um, it's not a, I don't know the exact numbers, but it's not a massive preponderance. So, you know, my list would be filled with roughly as many, you know, there, there would be a female preponderance, but it's not 10 to one, for example. I'm going to make up a number, but it might be, you know, six to four, seven to three or something like that, but it's not nine to one. Mm, yeah. Okay. So and do we know why that might be? No, I mean, it, it may be that it may be, it'd be interesting to sort of drill down into that. It may be a function of age because women live longer. Um, but but I suspect there could be some hormonal thing. I mean, as, as you kind of hinted at, a, a, the predisposition in terms of race, um, you know, ethnicity, um, sex, um, it, we don't understand that at all well. I mean, we really don't understand why women get more of some diseases than others. I mean, you know, outside of um, you know, conditions that are peculiar to women or, or, or have a function of hormonal, you know, imbalance, something like macular hole, it's hard to understand why that would be the case. We really don't understand it well at all. Mm. A, a, a general question, if you if you don't mind about um, eye injections, um, and a question about how how they can be given to people who have involuntary movements. You kind of need people to keep still, don't you? When injecting them, um, are are do, do you, are people put into a a thing that keeps their head still when they're having injections? No, um, I think people are often worried that they're going to blink, that they're going to move or sneeze or cough or, or shake their head around. And, you know, the, the vast majority of people actually manage to tolerate it very well and to keep reasonably still. Um, you'd be surprised when you, you'd sort of imagine it's a big problem, but we don't need to take people down or hold their heads still for the most part. I mean, there are a few patients who do find it very challenging, um, but they are, you know, they're a very small minority. If they had a condition like Parkinson's or cerebral palsy or something like that, would, would, would they be offered sedation or is there other meth methods? So, so even then, you know, you can normally do it, you know, you can, as I say, you can, rest your hand with the patient so that you're you're moving with them for example um the injection only takes a, a, a very small moment to go in there um so you, you know and also with the injection you've got a, you've got a, a fair margin of error you know it's it's not like you, if you're operating on on the macula then the head tremor is a real problem you know i mean you know having everything i said before you know that can be a challenge um, but generally speaking, if you're giving an eye injection, you've got a lot of space between you and the, and the, the vital structures inside the eye. So even if there is a little bit of movement, you know, your, your needle is not going near to the macula, for example, such that a small movement would lead to a, you know, a retinal tear. Mm. That's, that, that's amazing, really, isn't it? Um, uh, and I know that people are very frightened sometimes of eye, eye injections. We, in fact, have some buddies uh, some volunteers who are experienced patients and if anybody is concerned about and we will find somebody with macular hole as well um anybody who who, who either has either actually if you've had macular hole surgery and, and would like to be a buddy and wouldn't mind being um called up to ask if you'll speak to people who've yet to have the uh, treatment and really want to hear from the horse's mouth what it's like then do phone our advice and information service which is 0300 30 30 one one one. I'll give that number out again before the end of the evening. Um, uh, but if you would like to speak to a buddy, um, then uh, also phone that number, and we'll uh, put you in touch with somebody who can give you direct, um, direct personal experience of what it's actually like to have the treatments. Um, often people find that uh, very helpful, and we've often uh, turned people around who've been refusing to have the treatment to persuading them to have the treatment with um, great success. So if you're interested in that particular thing, then do phone our advice and information service, and I'll, I'll give you the number again before the end of the evening. So Tim, we're getting towards the end of the end of the evening. Um, now, can you can you say, looking forward for both, I don't know, AMD, eye conditions generally, macular holes, things like that, what what what's your dream for the future? Where do you where where do you want us to finish up? I, I would really like to get rid of injections for AMD. Um, you know, it, they do work, uh, and there are significant barriers to getting the drug inside the eye. The eye, you know, has, has done well over you know many many years of evolution to protect itself from the outside, you know, protect itself from the outside world. But and that makes it difficult to get drugs in there. You know, so I think the injections are are around for the foreseeable future. But I would love to come up with something that I'm, you know. That would stop us having to inject inside the eye um, because you know i can't see us doing it in two or three hundred years i just hope that, that the transition whatever it will be comes comes soon enough well could that be in practice it could either be a, a pill i suppose that treats the condition systemically throughout the whole body or what it's an eye drop C correct so i mean we, as you know we've been doing some trials looking at the use of a sort of robotically controlled system that fires in radiation to the back of the eye 
Uh, eye drops would be fantastic. Um, you know, none of the risks of injections or discomfort. Patients could administer themselves. They'd be given every day as opposed to you know, once a month or once every few months. Um, a tablet would also be good if it had a good safety profile and the drug could get into the back of the eye again. That's very easy to take and lots of these patients are, you know, uh, are taking many other medicines anyway. So it would be, I think, you know, acceptable to patients. Any, any of the above or maybe some other technology we haven't thought of yet. What are the, um, briefly, the, the barriers to that? So, you know, what, what's stopping us doing an eye drop? We've got the drug. We know, we, we know it works, whether it's Lucentis or Ilea or Beerview or um, Ferisimab, I forgot what it's called, Visu, something that's coming up now shortly. So we've got the drugs. Why can't we just drop them into the eye? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have tried. Uh, so, so, I mean, it, uh, it's, it's a long answer. <laughs> I'll try keep, um, but there are, there are barriers to, to drugs entering the eye. And a lot of the drugs that we're using are very big molecules. You know, they're, they're engineered molecules. They're, they're, they're enormous um, compared to many medicines. And when molecules are very big, it's hard for them to push their way through body tissues. And the eye drop is delivered to the, to the very front of the eye. Um, but actually, the macula is at the very back of the eye. So this drug has to kind of weave its way through the ocular tissue to, to reach the macula. And that's against a whole bunch of anatomic barriers that try and keep outside molecules away. And also things like the blood, you know, the blood, if you like, is a, you know, it has a, a stream of fluid running around the eye so that, you know, it, it's, it, can, it can't swim across the current of this blood streams inside the eye as well. So there are lots of things that remove the drug from the surface of the eye, remove the drug once it gets inside the eye. Um, and it's just too long a journey at the minute, but I'm sure we'll get there eventually. We just need a smaller molecule that has good penetration. And then, and then you know, maybe you ask me this question in five years time and I'll give you a very different answer. Thank you, Tim, very much indeed. We've got to finish now, we've run out of time. Tim, thank you very, very much indeed for your time, so generously given uh, this evening, I'm so grateful. Thank you very much indeed. Just a reminder uh, that there'll be another one of these with another leading super speaker um, uh, next month, the second um, uh, Tuesday of the month, that'll be Tuesday the 19th of July at the same time. Uh, seven o'clock. Um, if you want to watch this again or you've missed any of it, don't forget that this will be up on our website in a few days time and do pass on the uh, information about the availability of all our talks to people if you think that you uh, you come across anybody you think uh, would be interested in viewing them. They're all up there for everybody to see. Um, uh, the uh, advice and information service number, if you're interested in um, uh, finding out more about macular hole or these other conditions, or you're interested in our buddy service is 0300 30 30 111. 0300 30 30 111. The number's on our website and the team are there nine to five, Monday to Friday. Tim, thank you very, very much indeed. Once again, uh, it's been a delight having you as a guest on Macular and Me. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, thank you for joining us, everybody. And I hope to see you again next month. Thank you very much and have a very good evening. Bye-bye.